God kind of spoke to her and said, you know, you need to go back to church. You need to go to church. She hadn't gone a lot as a, as a child. So uh, that kind of started a process and through FCA and uh, the Reach Club that actually still exists at Orange Park High School. Raiders excited about Christ's homecoming. Jazz uh, through that process and, and some other sister churches. She said uh, it was after an FCA meeting uh, huddle that we had a few weeks ago that she said, I'm ready. I'm all in. And so the, the, at the last meeting before Christmas break, we were able to talk ask a lot of good questions and have a good meeting, and she said, hey, I'd really like to get baptized. So we're here today to baptize you, Jazz. She's really nervous, so she's looking at me. She doesn't want to look out there, so come on here. So Jasmine, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. I am proud to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in baptism, risen to new life. Amen. Amen. I think we can, uh, we can go home after that. Baptism and great worship. What a great way to start the day. Uh, good morning. Hope everyone had a great Christmas yesterday. I hope you were able to spend some time with friends and family and hope you're able to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I hope you didn't eat too much of Nana's desserts. Uh, that's not a confession. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, I also heard a great quote this morning. My wife Monica posted uh, something on her Facebook from The Unraveling. It said, December 25th is over is past but the celebration of our lord never has to end so i hope that's uh what you're feeling today um i'd like to begin today with prayer but um i'm gonna ask each of you to help me out we're gonna do it a little different instead of me praying out loud and speaking to the lord on our behalf it's gonna be a little awkward it's gonna be a little different but i'm asking you guys to take a couple of minutes to just to pray personally i know the awkward silence may feel a little uncomfortable and i know for the some of you maybe the first time you've spoken to him in a while Some of us may not know exactly what to say, and that's okay. So whether you're watching at home online or here today in person, whether you speak to him continually or maybe there's been a a break, a silence, I'm going to ask you now just for a couple minutes, just bow your heads, close your eyes, and just lift up whatever's on your heart and your mind to the Lord. Let's do that now together. Amen. Thank you for those prayers. Thank you for that time. In the education world, um, there's a, <clears throat> there's a, in the, excuse me, off my notes here. For those of you who like to know what's coming, <laughs> where we're going, there's a feature passage that we're going to feature today in God's Word. So if you want to bookmark that, uh, it's in Jeremiah 6. So if you want to go ahead and go, go ahead, we're going to get there. But uh, we're not going to get there yet. We have some work to do. Before we get there, got to build a foundation. So in the education world, there's a model known as classical education. Some of you are familiar with it. And we don't have time today to go into all the attributes and the, the, uh, the good things about classical education. It's not used in most American public schools. 
Uh, but we're going to open today by practicing one of its great attributes and that it teaches students how to critically think. In the American model, students usually sit passively while an expert models the, the work or teaches a concept. Students are then given problems to practice and work. They are then graded on that work and move on to the next concept. In the classical model, though, that's flipped upside down. Students are presented with a problem ahead of time that they don't know a lot about, and they are expected to struggle. They're given little or no information from the expert, and only after students have created possible solutions to the problem and been subject to failure and struggle does the teacher then come alongside them and teach the concepts through their work. So we're going to practice that now on a smaller scale. I'm going to ask you guys a couple questions, and I want you to spend a couple minutes talking to a neighbor, someone close by. If you're watching this online, if you're home alone, just take some time to reflect in your mind or maybe jot some, some notes down. So here's the first question. You're not getting any instructions. I know, I know some of you are going to be asked, I want to know more. We're going to struggle here. So the first question to discuss with somebody close by you, you've got a couple minutes here. You ready? What is a soul? What is a soul? Go. A couple minutes. Discuss with somebody close by. What is a soul? All right, let's get a little more personal now. Here's your second question. I see some, some faces out there kind of looking for answers. It's not the way the classical model works. You're working on the answers. So here's the next question. It's going to be a little more personal. We're going to dig in a little more here. How is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? Go. No one-word answers. I will give you that. <laughs> Go deeper. Lance Witt says that in uh, his book, Replenish, that in 40 years of being a Christian, being in ministry, no one ever asked him that question, not once. So we're going to dig in a little more. Let's start with the first question. Let's dig in here. What is a soul? Give me some, res- what'd you come up with? Life. Say it loud. Your very being. I like that. I like that. Your very being. Life. This very being that connects you with this world to the eternal world. Who you are. Part of me created by God for him to dwell in me. Excellent. You guys did some great work. So let's back up, though. And let's look at what a soul is not. So usually a good teacher will always give you some non-examples, right? So look at this uh, picture here. I know it's a little blurry, but I think Boomerang will, will help us out. And most people will get this reference here. You have Tom, who's obviously gotten tangled up with Jerry in some way, shape, or fashion and lost one of his nine lives. And if you 
seen this cartoon episode, he's, his little wispy soul comes out of him and climbs the escalator up to heaven. That is not a soul. That is a non-example of a soul. So let's dig into God's word before we get to Jeremiah 6. Let's, let's look at this. The Bible is the truth, is the source of all truth and knowledge. And so the Bible gives us some non-examples too. Look at Deuteronomy 26, 16. The soul is distinct from the body, heart, spirit, and mind. It's distinct. They're different. They're non-examples. Watch this. This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. So there's a distinction between the heart and the soul. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Obviously, there is a clear distinction between your body, your mind, your spirit, and your soul. So then, what is a soul? George MacDonald said it this way. He said, You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. The word soul in the Bible, in the Hebrew, it's first used in Genesis 2-7. It's it's called nephesh. Nephesh. In the King James Version, it says this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. The ESV and other versions use creature or being as one of our definitions was. But it's the same Hebrew word, nefesh. If you have the Blue Letter Bible app on your phone, it's a great tool. I used it, looked up nefesh and discovered its meaning. And I discovered that in the Old Testament, it's used 755 times. 755 times. Obviously, the soul is important to God if he breathed it into us and references it 755 times. In the New Testament, we see a similar word. It's suke. It's used 600 times. But both words, nefesh, suke, have the same root meaning. Breath. Breath. Somebody said life. It's, one definition even says it's of the throat. It is our very existence and our being. The soul is the immortal, unified existence of the body, mind, heart, and spirit. Dallas Willard teaches it this way. Great analogy. He says our spirit or our heart is like the CEO of our personality that makes decisions and directs activity by working in tandem with your mind. In contrast, he says, the soul is like the computer that runs the whole operation of our life. It's in the background making everything work well together. Like a computer that's running a church or a business, we don't normally think about our soul until it's not working, until it's not healthy. And that's what I want to share with you today. As we get ready to celebrate a new year, 2022, I am challenged and convicted in my own life that we may not have been living and breathing out of healthy souls. And I believe today we have an opportunity right now to begin healing and growing healthy souls, to be able to answer that second question, how is it with your soul? It is well with my soul. That's my desire and prayer today, that we can say confidently, it is well with my soul. Not because everything's rosy, not because the world is right, not because of my own doing, but because we as a church are walking so close to our Lord that our buckets are being filled with his grace and mercy. There are people in this room today that knew my grandfather, Paul Green, World War II, B-17 bomber pilot, flew and survived 25 missions with the bloody, the infamous Bloody 100th bomb group assigned to the 8th Air Force. They, this is the group that was subject of the 1949 movie 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. But to me, he was just Papa. And even as a lost person, I knew there was something different about him. He loved Jesus with all his heart, mind, and soul. 
Jesus was a beautiful name to him, and everyone knew it. Something else interesting about him is that before multivitamins had become a popular thing, he had discovered a product developed by Rutgers professor O. Wesley Davidson because his good friend and nurseryman Otto Stern was having trouble with his plant surviving the mailing and transplanting. Many of you know this product as miracle Grow. miracle Grow contains both macronutrients and micronutrients. I know you wanted to hear that today. That's what you came to hear. Macronutrients are the elements that plants use in greater quantities, including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. There you go. So my papa understood that like plants, the human body needs macro and micronutrients to grow to be strong and healthy. And if it was good enough for plants, well, then it was good enough for people. So, I thought it would be really cool today. My son had no idea what was coming, but he's sitting out there. And I thought it would be really neat for the fourth generation of green men to drink the concoction of miracle Grow that my grandfather drank. So Jackson, you ready, bud? I'm just kidding. You don't, you don't have to go. There's, there, there's a warning label on here. So I don't, I don't know if he, uh, I don't know if he, I, I actually only saw him drink it once or twice. So I don't know if he was like serious or like he was pranking us back in the day or if he just was low on minerals or uh, whatever. But I did look it up and, and the, the poison control center says, don't, don't drink it, no. Not that, so I, but I, I did. I promise you. I watched him drink it. <laughs> so while it's definitely not something we want to put into our bodies for human consumption, what my grandfather did understand is that there was a connection between what we put in our eyes and our ears and our mouths and the physical health. And if that's the case for our physical bodies, then the same has to be true for our souls. So I offer you today, not a to-do list, but a to-live path. Not a to-do list, a to-live path. First and foremost, the soul is eternal. It lasts forever. But where? In Luke 16, we see a clear picture of two very different souls. A rich man who has feasted sumptuously on this earth. And a poor man who just wanted some scraps from his table. Look at Luke 16, he says this. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. And in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. First and foremost, to live with a healthy soul, that soul must be saved. I was having lunch this week with one of our Operation Barnabas veterans and. We were discussing the often quoted truth that there will be many who miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance between their heads and their hearts. We can hear about Jesus, talk about Jesus, read about Jesus, even do things in the name of Jesus. But if a person has not surrendered their life to him and made him the Lord of their life, their soul is not saved. Is your soul saved? I'm not bragging because it's nothing I did. I'm not boasting because it's nothing I earned. I'm not grandstanding because it's nothing I deserve. I have no business standing on this stage today, but I can confidently state that I know the status of my soul because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He saved me, and he can save you too. First and foremost, a healthy soul is saved. Secondly, I'm talking to Christ followers now. You know your soul is saved, Yet you feel weary, tired, apathetic, angry, frustrated, afraid, 
Maybe life hasn't gone the way you planned. Lance Witt writes it like this. He says, your outward circumstances may not change, but you can change the trajectory of your soul. Intimacy can be restored. Passion can be reignited. Joy can be renewed. There is hope. And I believe the prophet Jeremiah points the way. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 6, our focus passage today. God's people, Israel, they've closed their ears to the word of God. And to Jeremiah's repeated condemnation of their sin, they've turned away. It says, the word of the Lord is to them a, a, a subject of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. They wanted no part of God's commands because living for God just didn't appear very exciting. It's a chapter of God's impending justice. It's a people ignoring Jeremiah's warnings. And yet right in the middle, right in the middle, in verse 16, the Lord marks out a way to a healthy soul. He says this, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. Did you hear that? Stand and look and ask for the ancient paths, the ways of the Lord, the ways of the saints and the followers of Christ before us. This is the path that leads to life, full and abundant. This is the narrow path leading toward God. Last week, Brian Hoffman was preaching in his pulpit, and he said, we're either going toward God or away. There's no stationary. I had an old coach once who was full of wisdom but really bad at math. He said it this way. He would always yell at us, you need to do a 360. You need to do a 360. And we'd always say, coach, you mean 180? <laughs> he was trying to tell, tell us to go the other direction. The Chinese have a proverb. They say it like this. They say, if we don't change the direction we're going, we're likely to end up where we're headed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm imploring you today for the sake of our souls, for the sake of our children's souls, for the sake of our grandchildren's souls, for the sake of the souls in this community that is so lost and broken, we must become a people who stand, look, and ask for the ancient paths, for the face of God. If you only get one thing from this message today, if you only make one New Year's resolution, if you want to truly change the trajectory of your own soul, the souls of those you love, the souls of this nation, the souls of this world, then begin today to read and cherish the word of God, the very breath of God. It doesn't matter if you start with an online reading plan. Start from the beginning. Start with the gospel. Start with a good devotional plan, one chapter a day. Start reading the Bible to and with your children and grandchildren. Read it with your spouse, with a friend. Discuss it. Question it. Write about it. Make it part of your daily rhythm. Doesn't matter where you begin. Begin today. These current generations right now, out here today, the greatest, the boomers, the X's, the millennials, the Z's, as we're all called, it is said that our generations have the greatest access to the Word of God in the entire history of the world. And yet we are the most ignorant to what it actually says. A preacher once told a man, he was counseling, who told him, I just never hear from God. He never speaks to me. He never answers prayers. The pastor politely and in love pulled out his Bible and placed it on his desk and he said, he already did. He already did. In order to love and serve and live out of a healthy soul, we must absolutely be daily engagers, not just readers, engagers in the word of God. The next path to replenishing your soul, finding rest for your soul, having a healthy soul. It's in the last part of Jeremiah's passage. He says, ask where the good way is and walk in it. Walk in it. Walk in it. We can't just be hearers of the word. We can't just be readers of the word. We have to be doers. God calls us in Philippians 2, 12 through 13 to this. To therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is not easy. This is not the easy way. It's not the busy way. This is not the wide way. And it's definitely not the popular way. It is the good way. What would Jesus do if he were in your current situation? If he was choosing whatever choice you're facing, how would he act? What would he say? How would he respond or not respond? Seek him first in everything we do. Repent of the sin in our lives. Quit doing 360s and do a 180. Let him have every aspect of your life. Here's one of these David Tarkington aha things that he does in his sermons all the time. Watch this. I figured this out. God is a whole lot better at managing my life than I am. (laughs) He does it way better than I do. And if we're going to find rest for our souls, if we're going to live and breathe and serve out of healthy souls, then we have to be able to genuinely say, Jesus is enough. He's enough. Finally, and there's so much more. We could do a whole series on replenishing your souls, but let's just focus on these right now. Let's just become proficient in these as the school term is. It will change marriages. It will change families. It will change relationships. And it will change the church in ways that in 2023, my prayer is that in 2023, we will be able to look back and say, wow, look what God did. Another path to a healthy soul is not to take the path alone. To lead others and to be led. Our Lord commanded us to go make disciples. The great commission of Matthew 28, 19 says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Like a good classical educator, Jesus allowed his disciples to experience a plethora of challenges and lessons. Then he poured into them through his word. And finally, he tasked them with the teaching of others. And he does the same to us today. Healthy souls are filled with the hearing and the doing of the word. And then they pour that into others. This is the good way. This is the God way. John Eldridge tells of a, his most memorable experience, one of the most memorable experiences of his life when he kayaked to an island off the coast of Alaska inhabited by a sleuth of grizzlies. I looked that up. A group of bears is a sleuth. Don't ask why. Just It is. Another useful tool for you today, along with Miracle Girl. After a 21-minute walk at noon in the middle of the day, they reached an impassable bog, a low-level jungle. No way to cross. But he looked down, and his guide showed him and said, Look, and through that bog, through that impassable jungle, there were these massive footprints. It was a marked trail where for centuries, older bears, much stronger and experienced, had laid down a proven way. We live in perilous times. Just turn on the news. There's mass confusion, division. Who are you leading on the ancient paths? And not just on Sundays, in your homes, in your workplaces. Those who are lost need a guide. Those new to the path need a guide. Healthy souls guide the way. How is it with your soul today? Healthy souls are saved. Healthy souls engage in the word of God daily. Healthy souls hear and read the word of God and do. They walk the walk. And healthy souls lead others in the way how is it with your soul today so we're going to close a little differently today i've prayed over this for for weeks and i really a few weeks ago saw this and thought man this is this is amazing watch the holy spirit work in here so i've been praying for the holy spirit to work in here today <clears throat> i've asked carla and the band and scott to come down and, and sing one final song 
Scott alluded a little bit to the story. Many of you know the story of Horatio Spafford, a successful lawyer and businessman. Horatio first met tragedy when his five-year-old son died of pneumonia in 1871. That same year, most of his wealth was destroyed in the great Chicago fire. Two years later, needing some replenishing for his soul, he decided to travel to England with his wife and four daughters to assist the late theologian Dwight Moody in his ministry. But he was delayed by a business problem, so he sent the girls ahead on a French ocean liner sailing from the U.S. to Europe. Four days into the journey, the ship collided with a powerful Scottish ship and sunk in 12 minutes. 226 of the 313 souls on board perished, including the four Spafford girls. Spafford's wife, Anna, was able to hang on to a piece of wreckage and was spotted by another vessel and sailed to Cardiff, Wales, nine days later. There she wired Horatio a simple message. Saved alone, what shall I do? Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio booked passage on the next available ship to be with his grieving wife. Four days into his journey, the captain of the ship alerted him to the location where the liner had sunk and his daughters had perished. Grief-stricken, heartbroken, dazed, confused, hurt, Horatio returned to his cabin and wrote this poem, which was later turned into our beloved hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Perhaps we cannot always say that everything is well in the world. We can't always say it's well in all aspects of our lives. There will always be storms to face. Sometimes there will be tragedies. But with faith and a loving God and with trust in his divine help, we too can say confidently, it is well. It is well with my soul. So while Carla and Scott sing this hymn, I'm going to ask anyone, everyone, anyone, if you feel led to come to the altar today, maybe you've never fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. Maybe today is the day you need to come and say, yes, Lord. Maybe you need to begin a life of obedience in Christ like Jazz did today. Maybe there is sin in your life that is poisoning your soul. Let's leave it here. Maybe you just need to come down today and open your heart to the Word of God, to engage, to stand, to look, to ask. Here is a place and here is a time to do it. I have prayed and prayed for this message and I'm being honest with you guys now. I'm not on the script anymore. I didn't deserve to be up here today. <laughs> it was surreal be standing in the church where my grandfather attended and was a member and served and I remember watching him he he looked and he stood and he asked and he walked and even as a lost young man at the time I didn't I didn't listen because the next line in verse 16 in Jeremiah 6 that says that the people didn't listen it breaks my heart I left that line out today because it broke my heart because you hear God speaking and you hear this amazing, amazing message from our Lord straight from his heart telling us how to have a healthy soul, telling us where to go. And it says in that very next line that the people of Israel said, no, we're not going to listen. And that breaks my heart because that was me for 28 years. I didn't listen. But I thank God that my grandfather said, here's the way. And he pointed me to Jesus Christ. So folks, if you feel led, come down here today. We're going to sing through the, the original version of the hymn. 
and then we'll end with a prayer. Amen. Thank you, brother. Woo. That's a great way to start the year. <laughs> Let me pray for you guys. If you need to talk, we'll be down here out front. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you for celebrating Christmas. And I just pray uh, this 2022, we're going to look back. I believe it. We're going to look back and say, wow, look what God did. Father, we come to you this morning. First of all, just say thank you that we can do this, that we're, that we're able to do this, that we're free to do this, God. Uh, we don't take that for granted. This is, this is a, a wonderful privilege that we can come into your presence and sing 
and gather and read your word and, and be challenged. And God, I just pray that for every soul in this room today that they can say confidently as I can, not because of me, but because of you, that it is well, that it is well with my soul. Be with us, guide us in those ancient paths, Lord. We love you, we honor you, and we lift up your name above all things. In your name we pray, amen.